Thank you very much for having me here to share some insights on the retail sector. Um, I'll start off by just to set expectations. I will not be doing a Donald Trump impression. <laughs> Mine isn't nearly as good as Freddie's. Um, that said, he is impacting the retail sector as well. Um, tweeting about Amazon a few weeks back, uh, Jeff Bezos' net worth dropped by about $11 billion. So he is touching the retail sector as well. Um, the sector is going through fundamental structural change. Um, the scale and pace of the changes that we're seeing in the sector today are really unprecedented. And it's a lot to do with Amazon, a little bit to do with Brexit, something to do with the discounters as well. There's a lot happening, and I'm going to try to make sense of these changes over the next 20 to 30 minutes. But I'm going to start off with a slightly philosophical question, which is what is shopping? What does it mean to go shopping? According to Merriam-Webster, this means to visit places where goods are sold in order to look at and buy things. But I would argue that you can be in your kitchen today pressing an Amazon Dash button or asking Alexa to add it to your list, and that is shopping as well. So the path to purchase uh, is what we, in the retail sector, um, refer to accessing retail brands, interacting with those, those brands, um, the touch point to the retailer. This is no longer straightforward. Uh, we've seen a proliferation in the number of retail touch points, and they're popping up outside of traditional retail channels. They're popping up in our homes, in objects themselves, and in media. So it used to be we used to just have the choice of pretty much online or store, but today we can press our dash button, we can ask Alexa, um, we've got virtual reality, augmented reality. There's a number of different touch points. And I think when you combine this with the proliferation and delivery options that we have today, same-day delivery, scheduled slots, um, increasingly one-hour, two-hour delivery. If you're in the US, Amazon will deliver your products into the boots of your car. So there is so much choice for the consumer, which really empowers us as shoppers, but adds a lot of complexity if you're a retailer. And just to give you an idea of some of the changes that we've seen over the past decade, um, the iPhone is only 11 years old. I think that's really important to remember because the rise of mobile commerce has really changed things and empowered consumers in a new way. But 11 years ago, the iPhone was just starting out. And today, two-thirds of the world population is connected by a mobile device. So it's really revolutionized retail. Drones, robots, voice tech, this all sounded like science fiction even just five years ago, and today it's becoming a reality. This idea of under one roof shopping, the one-stop shop, going to a department store or a large out-of-town superstore because it had everything under one roof, um, that made sense. But today, online retail is eroding that proposition because today you've got access to millions of products right at your fingertips. And increasingly, you know, they're being delivered the, the next day. A decade ago, click and collect was just something that Argos did. Um, Argos was unknowingly ahead of its time. Uh, today, it's become a, a staple on the high street. Multi-day lead times were acceptable. You placed an order online and waited three or four days for it to arrive. Today, again, same day, delivery is becoming the norm. The discounters have grown their share. They've nearly tripled their share of the UK market in the past decade. And globally, Amazon was the 47th retail, largest retailer 10 years ago. Today, they're number three. So lots and lots of change. And so Terry Lee, he, uh, I think, sums this up nicely by saying the retail market is bifurcating. We're seeing such polarization, and there will be very clear winners and very clear losers as a result. Um, so we're hearing a lot about this phrase, the retail apocalypse. And I think if you are a retail journalist today, it's very easy to jam this phrase into any headline along with uh, another phrase, which is the Amazon effect. Um, so it's, it's very buzzy. And I think I just want to touch on it because we have to acknowledge that stores are closing. Um, but it is very buzzy. It's got its own Wikipedia page. Um, and it's you know, constantly in the press about how you know, stores are closing at record rates and what will, look, what will our high streets look like in the next few years at this rate. So there is some truth to this. Um, in the US in particular, um, where this is a, a particular concern, last year 9,000 stores closed in the US. This year it's going to be 12,000. And it's happening in the UK too. Around a quarter of shops are expected to close by the end of this year. And I just want to make the point here that in the US, 
um, there is an oversupply of retail space, uh, which is a more significant problem than, than what we're seeing here. Um, the US has 24 square feet of retail space per person. This is five times the amount per person here in the UK. So this needs to be addressed as more and more people shop online. But here in the UK, what we're seeing um, is what I consider to be a perfect storm. So retailers are facing rising costs, inflation, business rates, rents, labor costs. I mean, everywhere you look, they're, they're under pressure. And that's in conjunction with subdued demand. Um, and in terms of inflation, I think that's particularly been a challenge, uh, obviously, since, since the Brexit vote. Um, for the past nearly two years now, the, week, the pound has been weak. So it's costing retailers more to get products onto their shelves. Um, and this is affecting, it's particularly affecting the supermarkets because around half of the products that we, um, half of the food that we consume here in the UK is imported. Um, so it's, it's particularly impacting the grocery sector. And, and of course, electronics retailers like Maplin who saw their costs go up by 15% because their buying is all dollar denominated. Uh, and of course, Maplin uh, went into administration um, earlier this year. So, you know, this is becoming the year of the CBI. I mean, you don't need to look very hard to see, um, you know, that it seems like every week there's another retailer announcing that they're closing stores or going into administration. Last week it was House of Fraser. This week it'll be Mothercare on Thursday, who's expected to announce around a third of their stores will close. Um, so it's leading to closures. It's also leading to cost cutting. Um, in the supermarket sector, we've seen hundreds of job, um, job cuts announced since the start of the year. Interestingly, it's leading to consolidation from some unlikely, uh, unlikely suspects like Sainsbury's and Asda coming together. And I see that merger as um, a, a reaction to uh, the need to, to have scale in the sector to compete with the discounters. And also it's about survival because Amazon is coming. And I will talk about Amazon in a little bit more detail. But also I think we have to remember that there are seemingly permanent shifts in both how we're shopping and what we're spending our money on. So how, of course, we're spending more online. Over the past five years, um, on sales of non-food products online have doubled. Um, and it's because we're ubiquitously connected, because we all have our smartphones and it's enabled us to shop, whether we're waiting you know, for a dentist or sitting on a train, and it's really empowered consumers um, in a, in a way that we haven't seen before. But I think what's interesting, you know, we, that, that I think that part's really well documented. Online is growing, high street is suffering. It, it is a little bit more complicated than that. And I think what's perhaps sometimes underreported is this, um, the fact that we are spending less on material stuff. When it comes to discretionary spending, we are increasingly prioritizing spend on experiences, going to the pub, going to the cinema, and we're not buying more stuff. So I think that's a really important, um, important point. Um, and it's hit the fashion chains hardest. So this rise in experiential spending. This is um, consumer spending over the past year, the change in, um, for, it, this is actually a chart taken directly from the annual report of Next, um, who's very keen to, <laughs> to stress that it's not, there are huge structural challenges, huge changes in consumer behavior, consumer values and priorities, and they're spending less on fashion as a result. We can't just blame the pub for closing clothing sector troubles. Um, there are other things happening. Again, another sort of perfect storm with, with the fashion sector. Obviously, when times are tough, it's easy to cut back on buying new clothes. Um, we've seen a lack of new fashion trends. We've been wearing skinny jeans for the past decade, and so there haven't been those new trends to spur spending. We have an aging population. Um, MNS has said that 60% of their female shoppers are buying fewer clothes today than they were a decade ago. There's a growing awareness of sustainability. Circularity in fashion is becoming a real trend. Um, and it's sort of a rebellion against fast fashion um, and this idea of buying nothing new. And also, we work very differently today. We've got a growing mobile workforce. More people are working flexibly. And there's less of a need to have two distinct uh, wardrobes. So when you put all these things together, you start to get a clearer picture about of why stores are closing. And I've sort of I see this in three, this is happening for, in three different, um, for three different reasons. So 
Firstly, you have the Air Amazon effect when your core category shifts online. This was Matt Blinn's challenge. I've included some US retailers here as well. Um, it's, this is when electronics move online, books, music. Um, so this, this, is, this, is, this is absolutely the Amazon effect. But also we've got more nimble competitors, um, more agile businesses that are making it harder for those traditional legacy chains to keep up. And that could be online, like um, Boohoo and um, Misguided, some of the online fast fashion chains, um, which are putting pressure on the likes of New Look. But it can also be um, more nimble bricks and mortar competitors. So the likes of Aldi and Lidl and the impact they've had on the supermarkets, or in the case of Toys R Us, the rise of B&M and Smiths, who, um, who uh, have, have, have made Toys R Us look quite complacent, and ultimately led to their collapse. And then lastly, you have overspaced with questionable relevance. Um, these are the department stores primarily, both here in the US and the UK, because there are a lot of similarities, uh, where they expanded when times were good and when it was cheap to do so. But now, with the rise of online shopping, um, their, their formats are somewhat questionable. And I think this is a really important point here, because we talk a lot about <coughs> online killing the high street. Um, but actually, some of it just comes down to being, being relevant to your customers. I mean, this is a fundamental rule in retail. If you can't be relevant, and if you can't differentiate from your competition, then you don't stand a chance. And again, that was a problem with, with uh, retailer like, not to pick on Toys R Us again, <laughs> um, but Toys R Us. But I think the death of the store is grossly exaggerated because at the end of the day, this is where we spend our money. So here in the UK, around 83% of retail sales take place in a physical store. And although the trend is downward, it, you know, I think we have to bear in mind that the physical store will have to evolve, but it's not going anywhere. I think what we will see is those retailers that haven't been able to differentiate, um, those retailers that have had fundamental challenges um, that have been saddled with debt, private equity owned, for example. Um, a lot of retailers are having the private equity kiss of death. Um, those are the ones that will be weeded out. And I think as a result, we'll see a stronger, more connected, more convenient and customer focused um, retail sector in the future. I just want to touch on another really important trend, which is this idea of um, online to offline, so O2O as, as we call it in the industry. Um, this is a real trend because I think online only today uh, has lost the structural economic advantages that it once had. And so now we're starting to see more and more digitally native retailers make the leap into the physical realm, which does seem quite contradictory when I've, up until now I've just said how stores are closing and you know, the high street is not dead, but it's, it's a challenging place to be. So I'm just going to try to make some sense of why this is happening and why I think we'll continue to see this convergence of um, online and offline. So this is something that I, I sort of spotted back in 2015. I predicted that we'd see the death of pure play e-commerce by 2020. At the time, this was the only retailer, this is an um, online only optician uh, based in New York, and they started opening st stores. And so I thought, that's quite an interesting trend. Why are they doing this? Um, and it was really to, um, and, and actually an important point here is that all of their stores, or mo the vast majority of their stores are profitable. So we started to explore this idea and actually since that initial um, example, we've seen all of these retailers make the move into the physical space. Obviously you've got the big retail chains, Amazon, Alibaba, JD making the leap into the physical space. Um, JD is a big Chinese retailer who are currently opening a thousand stores a week in China and they want that to be a thousand stores a day. So, yeah, they make Amazon look like, uh, <laughs> look complacent. <laughs> um, so we've seen lots of examples. Some retailers have moved into uh, just a few flagships to create brand awareness. Some, um, ASOS, Wiggle, AO, some of these don't actually have stores, but they have returns areas in other stores, in Asda, for example. So they're recognizing the value um, in having a physical, lo a physical location. Some have been acquis acquisition targets, uh, Bonobos and ModCloth have been taken over by Walmart. And of course, we've got other retailers that have gone down the concession route. So Bowdoin in John Lewis stores um, and Swoon in, in Debenhams, for example. So there's a lot happening in this space. So why? Why are they moving in onto the high street? Well, technology is breaking down the barriers between physical and digital. Um, the store today is much more digitally, digitally influenced 
primarily driven by mobile, um, but also through things like augmented reality, uh, digital displays, magic mirrors, and this will only accelerate in the future. There's still a long way to go, but this will, will accelerate. And also another way that the store is, was much more blended is because increasingly we're buying online and collecting in store. So the, the store is also being positioned as a hub for fulfillment. And finally, pervasive computing, um, which sounds a bit too scientific <laughs> coming, coming from me, but this is the idea that in the future we won't shop, we won't need stores or screens to shop. We'll have our Echo devices in our kitchens. Um, and that's also really blurring the lines. And I love this quote from Terry Von Biebra. He says that no consumer in the world gets up and says, I'm gonna buy shoes online and a fridge offline. That's not how consumers think. That's how retailers think. And I think what we're seeing now is retailers are recognizing they really need to change gears and, and think like their shoppers so they have one brand and one seamless experience across all those different touch points. But having a physical presence also helps to offset shipping costs. Amazon spends over $20 billion on shipping um, and having a physical presence can help to offset that. Also, digital real estate is crowded and it's expensive. Um, there are about a thousand online shops all vying for the customer's attention through one gateway, which is Google. So having a physical presence can create um, brand awareness. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Amazon here. Um, in their case, they're motivated to move on to, into physical locations because they need to drive adoption of voice technology. Um, Jeff Bezos was very clear in his most recent shareholder letter that they are doubling down on Alexa and they very much see this as their fourth pillar after Marketplace, Prime and AWS. And also it's a chance for them to grow their Prime membership because Amazon isn't Amazon without Prime. So, so just, a quote from Jeff, oh, just a quote from Jeff Bezos. Um, I think some of that might have gotten cut off, but the sentiment is there. Um, he was asked back in 2012 uh, whether they, they would ever open stores, and his answer was basically, um, yes, if we had a really, if we had a differentiated, differentiated idea. So that's the gist of it. Um, since that interview in 2012, Mr. Bezos has opened branded kiosks in malls across the U.S. These are Alexa showrooms, bookstores that aren't actually designed to sell books, the first checkout free store in America, a drive-through supermarket, the treasure truck, which is essentially Black Friday on wheels, um, event-driven pop-ups. Um, I was the very first visitor through the doors of their uh, Black Friday pop-up in London last year. Lockers in all kinds of unconventional places. This is an Amazon locker inside a library in South London. You're gonna appreciate the irony here. And concessions in some of their most feared competitor stores. So increasingly, uh, a whole topic for another day, but increasingly the retail sector is running on Amazon's rails in lots of different ways that I don't have time to get into right this second. But one point here is that this idea of coopetition, so teaming up with Amazon, if it helps to drive traffic to your stores, um, if it helps to improve the customer experience or expand your reach, I think we're gonna see a lot more of that in the future. And of course they bought Whole Foods. Um, so this is what Amazon's been up to on the bricks, in the bricks and mortar uh, space over the past sort of two, year, two to three years. Um, I think, I mean, there's so much to say about Amazon. Um, and I think the important point here is that as Jeff Bezos <laughs> said, they are not a Me Too retailer. They will crack bricks and mortar. And I don't think they're anywhere near doing that yet. Um, but they are relentl relentlessly dissatisfied with the status quo. And they're always looking for a way to improve the customer experience or you know, make things better for the, for the consumer. And I think what they've done in bricks and mortar just over the past couple of years is testament to that. Um, and there's countless other examples of what they've done generally. But I think Amazon, I don't think of Amazon as a retailer. They are a tech company um, whose sole purpose is perpetual innovation on behalf of the customer. And that's why they're feared. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just focus a little bit on what's hap what we expect, what I expect um, Amazon to do here in the UK. And again, there's so much to say about Amazon, so I'm going to try to get as much in as I can. I'm not going to go through all of these. I'll, I'll leave them for you to read and feel obviously very open to questions. But um, an important point here is that Amazon needs to continue to spread its tentacles 
across new sectors. And they have their sights set on grocery. They are coming for UK grocery. That is one of the reasons why Asda and Sainsbury's merged. Um, and fashion as well. And I think that within the next um, tw next two, two and a half years, I think we will see Amazon acquire a UK retailer. It's been great fun speculating who. <laughs> um, we can now rule, rule two retailers out, uh, so that's made my job a little bit easier. Um, there were rumors that they were made an offer for, they were exploring making an offer for Waitrose. Um, I think they could team up with M&S. Um, you can't rule Tesco out. Nobody even thinks about Tesco because they're the largest retailer, but actually Amazon's share of grocery is very, very small. So there is a chance that could happen. Um, but so it's a fun guessing game at the moment, but the point is that they're coming and this should worry all retailers, not just grocery retailers. And just to explain a little bit about Amazon, um, Amazon's attracted to grocery because of frequency, because we buy groceries every week. So they, get, they tap into the, uh, that high frequency purchase. And when they get frequency, uh, and also you have to be a Prime member to, to buy groceries through Amazon. And once you become a Prime member, you become addicted to the convenience, you get your Prime blinders on, and then Amazon becomes the first port, port of call. Amazon becomes the default shopping option, and that is the real concern for other retailers. So I think in the, in the, in the UK, they'll, they will buy a UK retailer. They need more supply deals. They already have Morrisons and Booths, and of course now Whole Foods. Um, uh, that they're using to, um, for, uh, to, on their platform, for their Prime Now platform, so you can get groceries from those retailers within an hour or two. So I think they'll continue to expand Prime Now. I think they'll look to establish more partnerships because they have the infrastructure in place, but one hour delivery is no good if you don't have a compelling range of stuff. So they need the brands to build out their offer. But what's Amazon's big end game here, the big picture? Um, I think they will fundamentally change the way we shop for groceries. I think we're a long way off from it. But if you look at what they've been doing around, um, I said at the beginning, dash buttons, echo devices, in the future we'll move beyond dash buttons and products will be automatically replenished. Um, they are already doing this in the US. At the moment it's device driven, um, but in the future as the technology improves, these sensors will be built into the packaging. So you can open, you know, you don't even need to open up your cupboard. Your cereal packaging will recognize, you know, your cereal box will recognize when you're running low and automatically reorder you a new one if you wanted to. Um, there is a whole kind of creepy versus convenience element of, of technology. Um, but that is the way things are moving. So what's the point? The point is that retailers will need to drastically reinvent the, the physical space. The layout of their stores will change the whole overall purpose and role of stores will change because as our homes get smarter, we don't have to do those boring, mundane tasks like buying bleach and toilet paper. Um, so stores will have to get more exciting. And I think as a result, um, we'll see a greater divergence between functional shopping, uh, which we'll have, we won't have to do as much of, and, and fun shopping. We're already beginning to see that the role of the store is shifting away from just being transactional and more towards experiential. These are just a few headlines from over the past year or so. Um, I think what's really interesting here is it's, it's also about retailers' mentality and, and their view of, of their own brands. So Apple doesn't want to be called a store anymore. They want to be called a town square. Uh, and Rafa here, the cycling brand Rafa here in the UK, they call their stores clubhouses, which I think is really interesting. Not every retailer can get away with this, um, but those that can really need to tap into the community, to the leisure aspect of retailing, to entertainment, you know, and I think that the um, same is happening with shopping malls in the US. They're dropping the word mall and they're calling themselves villages and community centers. So it's, it's really, I think, an indicate somewhat pretentious, but I think it's an indication that actually the future of the high street, the future of retail, won't just be about buying stuff, but it'll be about experience, service, and entertainment as well. I'm, this is a, a busy slide, and I, there's lots to say. I could spend the whole 20 minutes just talking about the store of the future, but this is how I see the store of the future evolving. Um, in a nutshell, it'll be more experiential, I think that'll be the really interesting thing to, to watch over the coming years. Um, you know, Debenhams is putting gyms, fitness centers in their stores. 
Um, John Lewis is sending some of their staff for a theatrical training so that they can provide an amazing customer experience and service. Um, all kinds of weird and wonderful experimentation to fill that excess space and to differentiate. I mean, at the end of the day, it's got to be about, what is it, WACD, what Amazon can't do. And at the moment, they can't do experience, they can't do service uh, in a physical setting. I think retail will become more collaborative. There's a great opportunity, again, to fill that underutilized space with concessions, um, and particularly as more online-only retailers look to get some space on the high street. It'll be more blended. Uh, we talk a lot about the store of the future being experiential, but also it needs to be reconfigured as a hub for fulfillment as well. So a place to collect and return products. Um, Amazon's doing some interesting things with Kohl's, a department store retailer in the, the um, US, where they have a, a dedicated Amazon section in Kohl's, who is a competitor, uh, where shoppers can come in, return their Amazon product. They don't need to pack it or, or do anything. They just hand over the product and are refunded instantly. So Kohl's benefits because they get customer traffic in and uh, fantastic for Amazon as well. I could see them doing this with a retailer like M&S or Debenhams here. And then finally, it'll be frictionless. The store of the future, you know, we won't have checkouts um, in the future. I mean, there will be some, it'll still be an option, but retailers are really investing in the checkout experience now. And it's, it's all about making the in-store experience as seamless, as frictionless as, as what you find online. So in summary, I think there's an urgency to act now. As we've seen from some of the recent retailers who've gone into administration, there aren't any second chances if you fail to adapt. An important point here is that you need to invest in technology, um, but you can't out Amazon Amazon. Um, so it's focusing on the things that they can't do. And I think in the future, uh, there will be more store closures. There's a lot more bad news to come. Um, but the high street will evolve to better reflect those shifting consumer priorities around entertainment experience and leisure. And at the end of the day, you need to focus on providing a customer-centric experience, even if that means teaming up with some unconventional partners um, potentially Amazon and other competitors. So that's it for me. Thank you very much.